Parliament voted the way the people wanted. And now we need to give every support to the Russian-American plan on chemical weapons elimination and hope against hope that this is the first agreement which the regime is actually forced to implement. But chemical weapons were only ever one deadly but small part of this catastrophe. We also need to make Herculean diplomatic and humanitarian efforts to build a political solution and a regional peace. And I believe that has to include reaching out to the new government in Iran. The conflict within Syria itself is a powder keg. The whole region is on a knife edge, or perhaps a cliff edge. And when you're walking on the edge of a cliff, the safest course is to take one careful step after another. If we dropped missiles on Syria, we would have no idea of the likely repercussions on Syria, on the region or the world, nor of the scale of possible retaliation against our own interests, including our military assets in the region. Retaliation could force us to counter-retaliate, and that is how full-scale conflicts begin. I could only say well done to the Russians who took advantage of John Kerry's gaffe and uh, persuaded the Syrians to sign the, uh, the Convention on, on Chemical Warfare. I would like, therefore, to say that we perhaps should follow the Russians' lead and persuade our own client states, Egypt and Israel, who has used chemical weapons, i.e. white phosphorus, in Gaza, to sign up to the Convention too. Lib Dem and UK policy on Syria is a mess, a disaster. Our dithering is making things worse. I'm not talking necessarily about bombing Syria or not bombing Syria, about John Kerry's slip of the tongue or Russia's opportunistic stalling tactics. The problem is that we have no strategy, we have no end goal. Our opponents run diplomatic rings around us because they know what they're trying to achieve. We can't usefully negotiate because we don't. We must not let the blunders of Bush and the lies of Blair obscure the fact that military intervention is sometimes the lesser evil and that it has secured in the recent past satisfactory or at least avoiding the worst uh, when it's taken place. I can see how Nick felt that he must act, but I wish that Nick had consulted with more people our parliamentarians and others within the party. He might say that time is too short, but we were working to an artificial deadline, an artificial timetable that we could have pushed back on. I would suggest, listening to the, some of the speakers this morning and our history in that region, that we have a moral duty as a country that has been so involved in the past to offer practical caring to the vulnerable. But let us begin by acknowledging the political and moral bankruptcy of so many Western policies in the region over the last century. Syria today is a theatre for proxy wars and the plaything of foreign interference. Russia and Iran are not the only bad guys. The USA, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are also part of the problem. They are all guilty, one way or another, of manipulating sectarian fault lines to their own advantage and reopening wounds when it suits their geopolitical agenda. There is actually a United Nations Commission on Syria, which has been established since the problem started in 2011, but it has not been allowed into the country by the Assad government. Again, the Russians, the Iranians and others must force Syria to allow that commission in and to act accordingly.